Uh, Dr. Wimmer comes with an incredible list of credentials, um, has written many books on statistical pedagogy, and has some really interesting ideas of how we should be teaching statistics in the modern world. One of the, getting to know him has been a pleasure, and one of the aspects that I find really encouraging is that he became interested in statistical pedagogy after he had graduated. And so for those of you, so your learning and the way you can go in your career does not end once you finish school, which gives me hope. So, <laughs> time over to him. Thank you. Um, pleasure to be here. It's a beautiful place to be. My wife's really mad at me because we've had almost, we've had some snow in Ohio, but not much. The last big storm that hit Boston missed us. Well, one coming through tomorrow. I taught how to use a snowblower. <laughs> <laughs> the forecast is down to only 10 inches of wet snow, not 12 to 14, so it won't be that bad. <laughs> All the times for me to leave town. <laughs> it's beautiful out here. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to talk for several hours about stat education, but I'm told I only have about 45 minutes or so. <laughs> I've got a list of uh, 19 items, things we're doing wrong with stat. Oh, we're doing many things right in stat education, I should say. Many things we're doing much better than we were doing 10, 20, 30 years ago. But there's still stuff we're doing wrong. I don't have time to do all 19. So I'm going to just choose randomly. Let you choose randomly. I brought a Oh one. One. It's to be random. <laughs> now we got whoops. Uh, to choose things. Uh, You'd be dead in day and age. <laughs> okay. So the first thing. Oh, by the way, my I created a list nineteen. I, I randomized the list. This happened to be what came up first. We use the word statistically significant. How many of you know that phrase? Statistically significant. You know what it means? Do your students? Do students know what it means? It's really bad wording. What it means is the thing we saw is unlikely to happen by chance. The drug beat the placebo. I got the Moderna vaccine, it beat the placebo. The success rate was better between those two than what happened by chance, usually. P value quantifies. How embarrassed and all about this to be? How likely is it this thing? Well, the problem is, people think, oh, it's a single, a simple result. So this thing is really good, this vaccine. In this case, it is good. Because COVID is bad, people die from, you know, and so I'm glad I got this useful, not just, but medically significant. But the word significant is used for all kinds of people for other stuff. And people think if it's significant, it must be important, no. It might be that what you found has no meaning whatsoever in real life, but the sample size was so large that you got a small p-value. People think it's important. The word significant is really, well, we could teach the rest of the world, don't use that word. Not gonna happen. People are gonna use the word significant. So when we use it, with the modifier statistically in front, eh, the modifier doesn't really tell people um, I prefer to say discernible. We have enough power in the study to discern an effect. That effect should be large, medium, small, important or unimportant. That's a separate question. The stat question is simply, can we say, this wouldn't have happened by chance or not? Because even then, you know, if the PVI is 0.04, well, one time in 25, that would happen by chance. This might be that one day out of 25. I prefer to think about a discernible effect, which may or may not be important. He about quantifies how embarrassed the null hypothesis should be. <laughs> Since the p value is less than 0.05, that means HO is rejected. There's a significant difference in degree completion between men and women. That sounds like there's an important difference. And maybe there is, we can't tell from the t-test or whatever it was, whether the men, women difference is important enough that the dean should care or whatever. Also, um, 
there's evidence of a difference. The difference might be small. And the null hypothesis you were testing, that there's zero difference between men and women, there is no chance in the world that the completion rates between men and women are exactly the same. And when they are, what, seven or so billion people in the world, you know, if you men and women and compare them to enough decimal places, there's going to be some difference. It might be built both at 63.2786, you know, but at some decimal out there, there's a difference. The only question is the difference I should care about. So is it bigger than some threshold? We know the null hypothesis is false. We know it before we even started. There's no way that those two groups could have been the same. Exactly the same. Now, they might be meaningfully the same. Let's treat them the same. Let's build a model that says they're the same. All models are wrong. All models are useful. You've heard that quote many times, right? Let's promote estimation and model fitting. Not getting p-values. I think it was in the news not too long ago. 62% versus 32%. Don Trump versus Clinton. 30 point margin slice, 10 points to 12 points. That's definitely statistically significant, this person at Tufts University said. Married men are a pretty big group. So it's pretty meaningful margin. Trump versus Clinton, men and women. Different popularity, politically important, sure. But uh, statistically, it's not statistically significant. It's a politically significant thing, quite separate from any pretest. I wish we would not use the word significant when I talk about a discernible effect. Whoops. Back to, oh, now I don't want to I don't use Prezi very often. I, I set a Prezi for this talk because I want to be able to jump around. I'm a klutz at using, I usually use PowerPoint. <laughs> and I'm a conventional kind of person. New number. Um, 11. 11. So where's 11 on here? It's the third one, right? Simpson's paradox. You all know what Simpson's paradox is? So the big question is, who's responsible for us learning about this thing called Simpson's paradox? Who first discovered Simpson's paradox? It wasn't Simpson. <laughs> Anyone know? 1903, Yule, Yule. Well, the first paper describing what we now call Simpson's Paradox. It's called Simpson's Paradox because in the 1950s, someone named Simpson wrote about it in a way that people could understand. That's <laughs> <laughs> so his name got attached to it. Which hospital would you rather go to, the city hospital or the rural hospital? What's your chance of dying? If you go to the rural hospital, well, you might be in good condition or poor condition. Simplifying life, patients are either in good or poor, you know, good is relatively. You know, or, um, people who are in poor condition have high death rates, 7% versus 6%. If you're, if you're in poor condition, you're going to die 6 7% of the time. If you're in relatively good condition, death rates are only 1% or 2%. And the death rate is higher. <coughs> the triangle, the diamond is higher than the, than the square. The rural hospital has a higher death rate than the city hospital for what kinds of patients? So the city hospital must be pretty bad. Well, if you look at the aggregate, the aggregate for the city hospital is at about five and a half percent. The aggregate for the rural hospital is about three and a half percent because most of the people in the city hospital were in poor condition. Dying at a 6% or 1% rate, but mostly in poor condition. So the city hospital's aggregate death rate is 5.5%. The rural hospital has mostly people in relatively good condition. 
30% poor condition, aggregate of seven and two is three and a half percent. The city hospital can be better, lower death rate, for either kind of patient, but worse overall. That's the paradox. If my hospital is better than your hospital, these people and those people, and that's the whole world, is those two kinds of people. If I'm better than you in both cases, how can you beat me overall? Does the really sick people get transferred to the city hospital with the specialists? The city hospital is mostly treating really sick people, and really sick people die. And so even though the city hospital is better, lower, one percentage point better, in aggregate, the city hospital looks bad because of this imbalance. The city hospital has a lot of poor patients. The rural hospital has relatively few patients in poor condition. So we, we teach this, Simpson's Paradox, and there are tons of examples of this. This is made up, make the numbers later, but Simpson's Paradox happens a lot in real life. If both hospitals had 60% patients in poor condition, apples to apples comparison, now the city hospital, is the winner by having a lower death rate. We teach students this first thing about your confounding variable, that text station, blah, 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 you know, that's the paradox. What do you do when we have the paradox? Well, you can adjust by using a common comparison point. We tend to skip that part. The other thing we can do is um, Berkson's paradox is much less well known. I've never heard of Berkson's paradox until a few years ago. You don't even know who Berkson was. But when you condition on a variable, you can create a negative association that's not there in the full population. For example, suppose there are two ways to end up in the hospital. You have disease one or disease two, or both. Suppose there were two ways to get be hospitalized, disease number one or disease number two. And suppose in the general world, these are two separate things, independent medical conditions. I go to the hospital, I walk around, go into room to room, you got disease one, disease one, you got disease two, you know, I, I look at these patients, some people have both, and I see a negative association. People who have disease one are less likely to have disease two, and vice versa. Real life example in the early years of or the years of roughly for COVID, some people I think in England noticed this really strange thing: smoking was a preventative for getting COVID. Who knew? And I should take up smoking if I want to. You know, before I had a vaccine, this is two years ago. No vaccines available, but people already dying from COVID. Take up smoking, Jeff, because smoking prevents death from hospitalization, at least, based on in London and other places in England, they looked at hospitals and found a negative association between smoking and COVID. Go from hospital to room to room, ask, are you a smoker or not? Are you here for COVID or not? Negative association. Because you're in the hospital for a reason. If you're not here because of COVID, you're more likely to be here because you're smoking issues, and vice versa. Using the hospital as your reference group is bad. <laughs> in the general population, these are independent things. In fact, smoking does not prevent COVID. It just doesn't. They're independent. Might actually be positively. Smoking is probably actually worse for you because COVID affects the lungs. But anyway, you know. But in general, independent things. But conditioned on just the hospitalized people, you see a negative association. Another example. I never played Major League Baseball because I can't pitch and I can't hit. If I could do either of those two things, I would have been a ball player, not a statistician. They make more money. <laughs> Pitchers in the Major Leagues can't hit worth a darn. Well, there's the occasional counting tip. But you know, for the most part, pitchers have lousy batting averages. And good hitters can't pitch. Really? You don't bring in your center fielder to pitch relief in the ninth inning because 
can't throw the ball. There's a negative association between hitting pitching among major, if you just look at major league baseball players, because if you're in the major leagues, you got to be good at one of those two things, or possibly both. This guy who came from the, you know, amazing, but most people are good at one or the other, not both. But, you know, if you bad at both, like me, you're not in the major leagues. These are independent things. But condition on a certain subset, and you see a negative association. My grandfather could not understand why can't pitchers hit? You need to understand Bergson's paradox. Well, I keep going. Get another okay. That's the end of that. Next topic. Where, where's that? My, my fifteen. Fifteen. The short one. Did you learn the formula for a t test? Yeah, it might be useful at some point in your life, but learn randomization testing instead. If Ari Fisher had owned a computer half as powerful as this one, he would have only done randomization testing, permutation testing. Probably someday someone would have developed a formula for a t-test, but why bother? You can do 10,000 randomizations very quickly. But Fisher didn't have a computer. Now that it is contemporary, so they developed a bunch of mathematical formulas that work pretty well. The t-test is a good approximation to the randomization test. But the real thing is the randomization test. And the t-test only approximate, approximates it. Um, there's also the idea I put in parentheses that there's only one test. I could spend all day talking about just that pedagogical concept of let's teach everyone there's only one test. But let's some um, ideas on that mathematical formula. That was a short one. Next random number. Five. Five. Uh, this one goes back. I've been harping on this one for many years. If you're going to do a t-test, it's valid if you have m sample, most important thing. Independent observations if you're doing a two-sample from a normal population. T is based on background population is normal. I don't know sigma. I use s because I use s in place of sigma. More uncertainty, fatter tail. My name is Gasset. I'm developing this theory called the T distribution. And so, you know, okay. Um, <clears throat> when I was a student 800 years ago, those are called the assumptions for the T test. Let's call them conditions. 805 years ago, when I was a high school student, I learned about the Pythagorean theorem assume ABC is the right triangle, then you prove some stuff. In math, you just get to assume stuff. Assume it's sunny and 75 degrees outside. What would happen if blah, blah, blah? In real life, it's, yeah, it's not sunny and 75 degrees. In statistics, which is the real life situation, <laughs> you deal with whatever you have. And under certain conditions, a t test is valid. Now, under other conditions, it's not. not. An assumption. I don't just get to assume normality. I can investigate normality. I don't get to assume it. My, my math colleagues get to assume stuff. Let's call these things conditions, not assumptions. Phantom number. Three. I'm going to do a t-test or an f-test, whatever. Um, I need to look up a p-value. There's a table in the back of the book. An exam, I could hand you a piece of paper with a t-table and the f-table in the back, you know. Because in the past we had to do that. Now we can just use technology to get a p value and do other stuff with technology. Anyone old enough to remember log tables? Slide rules? <laughs> yeah, um, let's use technology to find p values and other things, not use tables. Next random number. What? Fourteen. Fourteen. 
we teach the two sample t the one sample t test, two sample t test, and the paired t test. One proportion z test, two proportion z test. What if I have paired proportion data? I got to take a different course. The intro course only covers paired quantitative data. What about paired proportion data? It happens. My students don't know about that because it's not in our book. Well, I teach them, but anyway, most people don't. A McNamara's test. Anyone ever heard of McNamara's test? A few people, not many, right? Because it's not taught, it's not, but it's it's a really simple test actually. It's a uh, well, let me do an example. Um, the lost shoes example. There's a company in Berlin, Germany, that makes shoes. The name brand is Atheist. Who <laughs> named the company Atheist? <laughs> German, yeah. Um, I've never bought shoes from them, but apparently you can buy shoes in the US, you can order online. Well, at least you could in the past. I don't know if they're still in business, I don't know. Um, well, back, people complain, our shoes got, I, I paid, but the shoes never arrived. And the company wondered, was the US Postal Service somehow sabotaging their business because of the name of the company? And they see the name brand Atheist to be delivered to this, oh wait, Atheist? I'll throw those in the trash, you know, they get lost. Maybe. They so guys did a test. They found 89 US addresses in 49 states. And on the same day, sent two packages to each address. One with the atheist name on it. And the other, same kind of package, but they didn't put the name, they used the generic label on it instead of atheist. To test whether the atheist shoes got lost too often, lost. Um, my hypothesis is there's no effect. That if a package gets lost, so sometimes both packages arrived, but sometimes one of them didn't get there. If a package gets lost, it might be the atheist brand or the, or the generic. Well, the hypothesis is a half, 50 50. Alternative, the postal service is more likely to lose the atheist brand shoes. Data. Most of the time, both packages arrived. Never were both packages lost. There were 10 times when one package made it and the other didn't. All I care about are those 10. The other 79 don't tell me anything about HO. Just those 10. If HO were true, I'd expect what here? Five and five. I got nine to one, not five to five. And I'm HA is expecting this number to be. Atheist gets lost a lot. I tossed a coin in my room last night 10 times. I got heads nine out of 10. Do you believe me? Could happen. I couldn't get 10 out of 10. I expect to get five and five if I toss a coin 10 times. I could get a six to four split. How unlikely is a nine to one split? Simple calculation, simple binomial. Or I did the one or fewer, uh, I did, instead of doing nine or 10, I did zero or one. Get a p-value about one percent. If there's no postal service interference with delivery of packages based on how they're branded, uh, labeled, only one time in hundred would you get such imbalanced data as happened in real life here. There's pretty strong evidence that uh, getting lost is not a random thing. If you put the name great atheist on your package, it's more likely to get lost. So pretty strong evidence about that. Right? Is that real data? Yeah, this is real data. Yeah, this, this is real. I did, <clears throat> did not make this up. So, um, but anyway, it's a pretty simple thing. Um, McNamara's test actually does a chi-square, which is a, a Z squared, but it's, you know, it's, and you could just do a randomization test, I suppose one is. You could test this a lot of ways. The point is, if you have proportion data that's paired, you can, you can do a test. Okay. Random number. Ten. Ten. Oh, this is a long one. We don't give our intro students experience of multivariable. The gaze report. Some of you have you read the gaze report? Goals and assessment in Cisco education. 
a bunch of us wrote this report a few years ago. And one thing we stressed was, let's teach students about multivariable thinking in the intro course. Let's not wait to the second course or third course before they see more than two variables at a time. And here's a simple example. A nice simple example. That goes from Dick, here's a website, uh, Dick DeVoe collected these data. Oh, what's the fireplace worth? We have a fireplace at our house. It's nice to have a fireplace. It adds to the value of our house. Is the fireplace worth sixty-five thousand dollars? Yeah. If we did not have a fireplace, and someone said, "Hey, Jeff, we'll build a fireplace for you for only sixty-five thousand," yeah, I'm going to pay sixty-five thousand dollars for a fireplace. It's a nice thing, but it's not that nice, you know. But um, in this, this is in, I think in Sarasota, uh, New York, um, some houses with a fireplace, some without. The average price two hundred forty thousand versus one seventy five. The difference of about 65,000. Here's the analysis of this. Um, we could make a direct comparison between houses with and without a fireplace or fit a regression model, indicator variable, or do something else. Here's the direct comparison. You have a fireplace in orange or you don't in blue. And there's skewness in both of these, but that's okay. Um, big data says, if you have a fireplace, the house is worth about 240,000. No fireplace, about 175. The average difference is $65,000. So, that neat, simple comparison, the fireplace is about $65,000 more. But again, no one's going to pay 65 grand for a fireplace. Not that, especially if you're talking about houses that only cost around 200000 to begin with in this point. There's no way a fireplace is worth that much. So what could possibly be going on here? Well, first, actually, um, I could do regression. I like doing regression. So I could build a model, a regression model of dummy variable, x, one is zero, with or without fireplace. Fireplace, x is one, no fireplace, zero. Beta zero plus beta one x. Let me, let me look at the graph first. Uh, here's the graph. Fireplace, no fireplace, 240,000, 174. The slope is 65,000. Going from no fireplace to yes fireplace, line goes up by about sixty-five thousand dollars. Same as a simple direct comparison. And I can build a model that says price as a starting point plus an offset that depends on having a fireplace. Plus man and mirror. If there's no fireplace, x is zero. You get a starting point plus man and mirror. With a fireplace, x is one, you get beta one times one. And you add beta one to beta zero. The difference between fireplace yes and no is beta one. If I fit the regression, the coefficient is 65,261, which is exactly the difference between the yes or no fireplace data. Well, the p-value is zero, the four decimals. The t-ratio is 14.4. Huge evidence of a difference in cost between houses with or without a fireplace. A highly discernible, as some people would say significant, effect here. Fireplaces are worth a lot. Well, they're worth something. But again, I, don't, I still don't believe it's 65,000. So what else would possibly affect why some houses cost more than other houses? Sounds like there's some omitted variables, but maybe like it's a proxy for the house size or like bigger houses tend to have fireplaces. Yep. Like Big houses are more likely to have a fireplace than small houses. How big is your house living area, square footage? This is houses with a fireplace and without. This looks like the earlier graph in orange and blue, but this is living area. Um, Yes and no. A uh, fireplace has no living area, how many square feet, not price. The orange fireplace houses are big. The blue, no fireplace houses are smaller. Big house costs more. Living area affects price. With a fireplace or without a fireplace, either way, living area affects price. Big houses cost more than small houses. 
So I could do oops, multiple regression by putting this covariant living area. And I get beta 2x2 added to both of our previous models. And then we get the multiple regression. Living area has a T ratio of 37.4, p-value basically zero. The marginal effect of a fireplace is something under $6,000. The p-value is 0.13. Controlling for knowing how big the house is, a fireplace still adds value. It's still positive. Well, not discernibly different from zero, but you know, it's positive. But nowhere near 65,000. Not even 6,000. The only problem with this analysis is I had price, fireplace, living. I had three variables at the same time, and I'm teaching an intro class. And my students handle three things at once. I think they can. But traditionally, we don't do multivariable stuff in the intro course. Why not? You can actually do this on day one. Not the full model fitting, but the, the graphical stuff you could show on day one. And I think you should. Next, uh, well, someone's going to tell me when to stop, right? <laughs> I'll be attentive. Uh, Nineteen. Nineteen. This is a short one. If I'm doing a null hypothesis test, I might have a non-directional tumor. Maybe the vaccine ties the placebo. Maybe it's not tied. Maybe the vaccine makes you more likely to get COVID. I think it either it does nothing or it helps you. I might want to do a directional test. But maybe I want to do a non-directional test. Usually do non-directional tests. And suppose I'm comparing Moderna to Johnson & Johnson. Early on, we got these two things. I forget Pfizer for the world. Just, you know, Moderna and Johnson Johnson got these vaccines. I compare them to each other. Which one is more efficacious for preventing COVID? I don't know. I'm telling you, know, it's, it's two years ago. I'm doing some research. No one knows yet, right? HO, they're medically the same. HA, one is better than the other. Non-directional. I get the data. Moderna is 94% effective. J and J is only 78% effective. Whatever. I think something like that. Well, you know, Moderna was better. They were both good, but Moderna did better than J and J. I was doing a non-directional HA. The data show these are not the same. They're different. What conclusion can I announce to the world? I will say there was strong evidence of a difference between these two vaccines. And I can't tell you which one is better because I did a non-directional test. Sure. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, and the winner was Moderna. I'm going to give you a directional conclusion to a non-directional test. I have friends, one in particular, who's a very well, I won't name him, but a very well-known statistician, uh, well-known in stat education. Every time he see each other, uh, we fight about this. He thinks what I just did is stat mal statistical malpractice. To give a directional alternative to a non-directional test, he thinks is statistical malpractice. I think he's wrong. Thanks, number. <laughs> Since I'm right, I'll just move on. <laughs> I think you already did 15, right? One. And 11. And I'm going to hit all of them that you've already done. You should have done this. I got 15 again. 18. 18. <laughs> what happens if I roll a 20? I always skip that. <laughs> the multiple testing problem. Oh, we all know what the multiple testing problem is. I love this. Um, I couldn't make it big enough. To, you've seen this at JCD Cardona with the. You, you've seen this one, the other means cause acne. This, this one, XKCD is so good. This is one of the better ones. 
Jelly link between jelly beans and acne? We found no link between jelly beans and acne. Oh, but here certain colors cause acne. Certain colors of jelly beans. So we tested no link between purple jelly beans and acne, p value bigger than 0.05. No link between brown jelly beans and acne, p value bigger than 0.05, and pink and blue. And, and they go through all the 20 different colors with p values bigger than 0.05, except green jelly beans, acne, p value less than 0.05. Headline, green jelly beans link with acne, 95% confidence. Point of five test. If you test 20 things, you're going to get one false alarm on average, just, you know, because that's what point of five means. You have to adjust for doing lots of tests. Um, and people know about that, but we tend not to talk about the garden of forking paths. So I got this data set on these students you see who, while well, some were in the uh, class that used our studio, other students used, is our studio really better than Minitab or not? I don't know. So I'm, you know, some students randomized, you know, and I comparison and it turned out they were statistically tied. Oh, but you got to just look at seniors because, you know, let's just look at the seniors, and, you know, and look at them. Well, there's still, but just look at the male seniors majoring in history. For them, of course, I did that study because my dad was a history major. Uh, history has always been my favorite subject after stats. But the statistical analysis is going to be about, and of course I'm a man, so I studied, and I'm, you know, I can justify after the fact why that particular sub analysis is what I wanted to look at all along. And I'm really good at lying to myself. I remember you, the first, right now, Feynman, the fist, famous fist said, the first thing you have to remember is, don't fool anyone, and you are the, the easiest person to fool is yourself. I can walk out just completely convinced that's what I want to study all along, because it shows up as the thing that's, you know, that pops out in the data. Andrew Gelbman calls this the garden of forking paths. I go here until I get to a small p-value, and I report that one. And the journal doesn't know. There were other, and I only did one test, actually. It's not, a, I didn't do, like the jelly beans, 20 different tests. I only tested one thing. Male history major, you know, seniors. I only did a formal test once. But along the way, I chose things to end up with the one thing that would give me a small p value so I could publish and get tenure and do a formal professor and all that good stuff, right? Um, that was a reproducibility project. Probably, oh, no, there's nothing there. It's just a C3 reproducibility project. This is the folks who are reproducing a lot of. Psychology research trying to, you're familiar with this project? So I'm going to tell you about it later. I'm running out of time. And publication bias. Dan Golding gave a TED Med talk a while back. Antidepressants pre registered, 12 different antidepressants, uh, tested in lots of different clinical trials that were pre registered, and almost exactly split half and half positive versus negative result. The antidepressant works, or no, it doesn't. Half the studies, it worked, half the, it didn't. Half the time, the placebo was just as good as the antidepressant. Among all the studies, what got published? 37 to 38 positive results were published. Of negative results, only three made them into publication. I'm a consumer of news, and I see that there are 40 published studies about antidepressants. Almost all of them show that they work. Almost all the published studies on antidepressants show that antidepressants are better than placebos. It's, over, it's clear, you know, yeah, there are occasional studies that doesn't find a difference, but overwhelmingly, the published studies by carefully done research, you know, show antidepressants work because the others end up in the file drawer. You can't blame the consumer. They go to the medical literature and they find studies and 37 say good stuff. Okay, next. I have a question. Oh, question, yes. I have a question about that. Yeah. So all you talking about, all, all the stuff you're talking about is really interesting, but that particularly is, a, I think, a big one for me. What do you think we can do about that as maybe in our area of educational research? What can we do to try to break that iceberg problem of, 
of not all this information being out there. So NIH is trying, and FDA are the whole pre, so the, this talk, there were 38 and 36 pre-registered studies. So if you want your drug to be approved, you can't just go to the FDA with the clinical trial that showed it worked. Ahead of time, you got to register it, so you're going to do a clinical trial, and they get to see all the, the positive and negative. So NIH is taking that approach, which is a relatively new thing even for them. Only in the last decade or so, they really focused on that. But for other research, yeah. tell people to be ethical. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're guarding a fork and path. Like, yeah, it's like, yeah. You should really, if, he's, if, he's, if there were 20 colors of jelly beans, tell them, shouldn't let you study all 20 of them and only green showed up as a small p-value. But that's again, it's being ethical. Um, and again, with yourself first, and it's so easy to, we, confirmation bias is such a big thing in life. So teach students about confirmation bias just as a general part of life in psychology or sociology. You know, and it spills over into stats here. But confirmation bias, I mean, look at where the US is right now, politically. Turn on the news and some people believe one thing, some people, something very different. I talked to my kids about when I was their age, you had ABC, NBC, CBS, they all said the same thing. Walter Cronkite, Huntley Grinkley, and uh, they, they were saying basically the same thing. It didn't really matter which network you watched, you got the same basic news. Now you get very different stories. Maybe you get all the news on Facebook. So you get people hearing very different things. And of course, if I only hear certain things, I believe it because it's what I'm told. There's this other story out there that's also a story that I'm not hearing about. But I believe what I'm told. And I ignore, if I get some evidence that doesn't fit my worldview, I ignore it. Humans are really good at that. So we're fighting many, many years of evolutionary history about how our brains evolved, how we are social creatures. I want to fit into my crowd. When I say something and my buddies say, I, I sort of, oh, I got that line of, you know, I, and I fit in with my buddies, right? So what can we do instead, Ed? Recognize it's a real thing. It's not just stats, it's much beyond stats. It's confirmation bias and what remembers is, is a huge part of living. And in the US it's gotten much, much worse in the last couple of years because of how news gets filtered and so on. And in stats we'd say, this is a real thing that affects stats as well. Because if, um, if only certain studies actually get reported to NIH or the FDA, and other stuff doesn't even get reported, then what people see is going to be very misleading. Well, the solution is not a better calculation or more, you know, it's or bigger sample size. None of those things we talk about, giving a bigger sample size that's truly random, all that's kind of just for the red covariates, none of that solves the problem of I'm looking right here. Um, it's a problem way beyond stats. But as said, stat educators, we are obligated, I think, to tell the students it's a real thing, but they should be. And if someone has a better solution, please let me know. <laughs> Seven. Seven. I'm going to check things off. So. Oh, good. This is one that I, I, I stored a few of these at a time that I want to make sure to talk about. Um, that p-value, 0.2681 that the computer gave me. What if we round out the 0.27? Let's call it 0.3. I have never in all my life of that research and consulting and so on, ever had a situation in which it mattered whether the p-value was 0.3 versus 0.27 versus 0.2681. It's big. Don't tell me the p-value had four decimal places, because that implies those decimals mean something. They don't. p-value is around 30%. Those extra digits, if it were mathematics, one third is not 0.3, even 0.333. Those are different, but in stats, 0.33 and 0.3, they're the same as a p-value. It's like, you know, yeah, could have happened by chance. Nothing here, let's move on. Right. Reporting extra digits implies they mean something. One of my dad's favorite expressions is we measure with a micrometer, we draw the line with a piece of chalk and make the cut with an ax. <laughs> Measurement error. 
is a real thing. We ignore it. We pretend these data are exactly accurate. There's no measurement error at all, let alone the whole missing values thing, right? And then we calculate the four decimal places, the resulting p-value. That pseudo accuracy, again, it implies something that's not real. And that's misleading. Next random number. Six. Six. The great the overzell hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is something people should learn. It's not that big of a deal. P values are not good measures of strength of evidence. You, I, the dance of the P values, I sent a link out about that. People take a look at you know, if you haven't seen the dance of the P values, take a look. Google dance of the P values. And P values bounce around a lot. values the probability of data at least as extreme as you got if HO is true, the opposite conditional thing that people care about, what's the chance HO is actually true given the p-value? The p-value is 0.05, the chance HO is true is about 40%. In the sense of people that do a simulation, create a million situations, half million HO is true, half million HO is false. These are situations, generate some random numbers under those, the conditions, and submit all that to t-tests whenever it gets a bunch of p-values. You got a million p-values. Look at the p-values where, where the p-value is around 0.05, say. You might hope that those subcases would be mostly from the, the HO false bucket. Now, about 40% from the HO true bucket. But take any, any of p-value and focus on that p-value, condition on that p-value, from these million studies, if the p-value is around 0.03, about 28% of those came from situations from the bucket in which HO was, was true. The p-value is not anywhere near the chance HO was true given the data. It's almost off by an order of magnitude. So let's um, model more and think about formal inference less. Build models that are gonna be wrong. Your model is going to be wrong, but it can be useful. Doesn't have to be, it's not going to be perfect. It can be useful. And if the p-value is at 0.16, 0.04, you know, you include or not include a variable based on not just what the data show you, but your prior information about the situation. And um, oh, I skipped right to. If you act, I do expert witness work. I was told long ago. There only are six answers you can give as a witness when you're under oath and the opposing, the opposing attorney is asking you a question. When you testify, ahead of time, you work out with your attorney what you're going to say. It's all scripted, basically. But then the other side gets to cross-examine. This is not fun. The reason I charge so much to do consulting work as a uh, testifying is because it's the most stressful thing I've ever done is to be cross-examined by a really good attorney. It's, way, it's worse than taking your qualifying exams. It's, <laughs> You know, but I was told whatever question you ask, there only are six possible answers you can give. You can say yes, you can say no. I don't know, that's a real good one. I don't remember, that's another one. The judge always believes that. I don't, I don't, sorry, I don't remember. You can buy time by asking, would you please repeat the question? Does someone know what time it is? So um, you can say green. I should explain green. If the question is, what color was the car you claim you saw and hit in an accident? You don't say, you mean the late model Ford with the radio blaring and the guy with the beard and the window down and the higher license plate? What color was the car? You know what time it is? Yes, I do. What time is it? 12.50. I didn't ask you what time it was. I asked, do you know what time it is? In real life, if you ask someone, you know what time it is? And they say, oh, do I know what time it is? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> then you can think you're a complete donkey. <laughs> On the witness stand, you answer the question that was asked. Do not elaborate. You answer the question that was asked. And you force the attorney to ask you the other question that they should have asked in the first place. I hope that they never get to that question. 
I'm doing this here because hypothesis testing is the opposite. The p-value answers a very narrow question. Might these data have arisen by chance? It doesn't tell me if the data are important. It doesn't tell me if there was measurement error. It doesn't tell me if there should have been a covariate in my model. There are a ton of things I want to think about that I'm not told about with the test. I want to do one other thing. I'm going to skip. Um, any one more topic? I have. Um, because I want to do that. We didn't get to 13. I want to have a roll of 13. Effect size. I want to teach about effect size. How big is the effect? Is Moderna better than Johnson & Johnson? Well, by how much? Moderna and Pfizer did not tie, but they were real close. Oh, I've got Pfizer, i got Moderna. They're the same. Well, not exactly the same, close enough. J and J was really different. What's the effect? Sample size matters. Here are some formulas for the first the t test. Sample mean minus hypothesized mean divided by s over the square root of n, rewritten in this way. There's an effect size, sample mean minus population mean scaled, times an inflator to the sample size. If I'm comparing two samples, there's an effect size inflated by sample sizes. Or maybe I'm doing regression, testing a slope, I might as well test a correlation, They're mathematically equivalent. There's an effect size and a sample size, or an F test in ANOVA. There's an effect size, some square model created some squared error, and a factor that involves a sample size. Any effect will show up as big. I never played the game World of Warcraft, I'm not a game fan. But apparently, millions of people have played this game. It involves some sort of conflict or whatever. And you get to choose to be part of the alliance with the horde, what I'm told. And some people in the US play, and they choose the alliance with the horde. Some people in Europe play, they choose the alliance with the horde. In the US, 55% choose the alliance. In Europe, it's 55.4%. The Europeans prefer the alliance more than the US does. Because 55.4 is bigger than 55.0. Right. Apply a test. The p value is 1.4 times 10 to the negative 9. The p value is microscopic. There's a wildly discernible, some people would say, significant difference between the European players and the American players in this game. There isn't. It's 55%. The alliance is more popular than the horde, but not quite 50-50, it's 55-45 in the US and in Europe. And don't tell me this 0.4% thing matters, but the p-value tells me, wow, microscopic p-value, hugely significant, that's not significant. And I don't need to stop talking about that, right? Because I, I have more stuff I could do, but... Um, He's like me. So never want to stop so talking again, about um, this. I'm trying to get to everything, but this morning I haven't talked about, well later about what I didn't get to. Um, someone once said, when you're giving a talk, don't be boring. Nobody plans to be boring, but some people don't plan not to be. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it wasn't boring. <laughs> We'll be staying here for soup kitchen so you can ask more questions.